Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Spring 2022 Engineers for Exploration info session. So before we begin, I think we want to do maybe a quick discussion of what Engineers for Exploration is. Ryan, is that something you're interested in talking about? Yeah, sure. So hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Ryan Kastner. I'm a professor in computer science and engineering here at UCSD, and I'm one of the co-directors and co-founders of this program. Uh, so this program has been around for a long time, uh, more than a decade. Uh, and it was uh, started uh, by a National Geographic Explorer and a very famous UCSD alumni named Albert Lynn and myself. Um, Albert is uh, uh, still exploring to these days and on National Geographic and, and doing some really cool stuff. Uh, uh, I heard he's back in the jungles again, uh, very, very recently uh, to, for another series. Uh, uh, but anyway, uh, we started this because Albert at that point was doing one of his first um, expeditions. And that expedition was to try to attempt to use technologies to find the tomb of Genghis Khan. Um, and uh, he came to me uh, as a much younger professor then and uh, asked about, um, you know, do, could, do you think we could get some students to help out with this project. And I'm like, I think we can definitely get some students to help out with this project. It sounds pretty amazing. Um, and that really spawned uh, kind of just the start of this program. But uh, since that time, we've uh, done traveled all over the world. Uh, we've done all kinds of uh, built all kinds of amazing technologies ranging from uh, drones. So the picture on the right there is my co director, Kurt Sugars, who's a ECE professor. Uh, in Belize, they were looking for uh, some harpy eagles uh, in, in the jungles in the rainforest of Belize and using that uh, fixed wing drone. And the picture on the left there is uh, some past E3 members, uh, so Quinton and Perry. I'm not sure who the last one is in the back, but um, mapping some, some caves. Those are mud caves um, in the uh, Anza Borrega Desert, not too far here from San Diego, but the goal was, oh, that's Dylan, um, excellent Dylan. Um, uh, the goal was to develop technologies that would then allow us to take, uh, to, to map uh, excavations, uh, Maya excavations, uh, archeological excavation, uh, excavations in, in Guatemala and other places. Uh, so using LIDAR and 3D cameras and all kinds of other really cool technologies. And so the overall kind of goal of the program is, um, the uh, you know uh, the need to develop technologies driven by uh, explorers, by scientists, uh, by ecologists, by marine scientists, uh, and all of our collaborators. So we have uh, about ten different projects that are active right now. We have uh, a large number of uh, student leads that you'll hear from here shortly um, that direct these projects. So these are student-led projects um, that directly interface with uh, people like the San Diego Zoo. Uh, archaeologists, like I mentioned, uh, ecologists, people in the Marine Science Institute here at UCSD, uh, the Nature Conservancy, NOAA, we've had kind of, uh, projects uh, by people all over the place. And uh, the, the real goal is to get you as students to uh, be able to show off your skills, show off the things you're learning in classes, but also learn skills, learn how to develop these technologies uh, and take them into the field and uh, make the lives of our collaborators better and uh, kind of jointly explore the world and understand the world um, uh, using, using modern technologies. Uh, so that's what we try to facilitate. And like I said, it's very student driven. So what you'll be hearing here is from all of the student leads um, on different projects. And the goal of this info session is to try to get you uh, to get more people involved in, in, these, in these projects. And so the student leads will uh, talk about each of the projects. Uh, we'll go through them one by one. Uh, and then they will also discuss sort of what sort of skills do you need or do you, should you want to learn if you want to uh, take on this project? What sort of skills will you, you know, what, what does this project require? Uh, and we get this question a lot and I'm sure we'll get it uh, this time as well. But uh, what we want is we want students that are dedicated and willing to learn. And um, you don't necessarily have to have those skills right now. So, uh, you know, if you want to pick up these skills, this is a great way to do that. Uh, learn, learn by building things and by working with in teams and uh, developing technologies that, that will be used all over the world by you, hopefully, in the future and our collaborators. Um, 
So uh, yeah, I think that's it. I don't even know what's on these next slides, but that's okay. I think I probably covered most of the aspects of that. Um, yeah, perfect. And these are the, the projects that we have and that we'll be discussing today. And um, basically, um, like I said, they'll, they'll give an overview. Uh, they'll talk about what they're looking to do this quarter. Uh, and then there will be a application that we'll talk about at the end where you can apply um, in order to participate in some of these projects. And we'll, uh, the different projects will handle it different ways. Um, but generally speaking, they'll talk, reach out and talk to you if they, they think the, uh, the, the fit is good and, uh, and try to figure out how to get you involved. Um, so uh, yeah, without uh, further ado, I think we'll, we'll kick it off to the first project, which I think is, is Nick in this month, and I believe. Hey guys, I'm Nick. I'm the current project lead of SmartFin. I've been working with this project for about two years, and it's something that I've greatly enjoyed the whole time. And today I'm excited to present to you about what this project is. On the next slide. So the smart fin is a longboard surfboard fin that is capable of gathering data through its sensors, including if it's in water or not, the temperature of the water, the location of the fin, acceleration of the fin, and a lot more. And so from these sensors, we'll be able to produce other information such as wave height. Next slide. So the real world applications of the fin. With the smart fin, scientists will be able to gather denser data from many beaches. They'll be able to produce more accurate wave height and water temperature forecasts, find out where, when, and how long people are surfing and more. Next slide. So right now, we're currently focusing on calm and filters because the smartphone only provides inertial data from, it's like from the accelerometer and gyroscope, et cetera. And so we're kind of figuring out how to calculate the wave height from this data. We tried using double integration, but that introduces a lot of noise and makes the position data unreliable. So we decided to use calm and filters and calm and smoothing to combat that issue of noise and provide a better estimate using inertial sensor data. Next slide. Uh, next slide. So our future plans for the column filters. Am I lagging at all for everyone? It seems, Nick, like you're, yeah, the, the slides are slowing, showing slower to you than others. So we're on the common filter one, future plans. Okay, shoot. Well, um, hopefully my audio is good. So our future plans for the common filters are to build on the current skeleton code. And we're working on noise adjustment matrices to acquire after analyzing the calibrated data from our fin testing loop closures and cross-checking with occasional GPS reading. And we'll be looking into calm and smoothing algorithms in the future. Next slide. So another aspect of the project that we're working on is thermal design. Our current sensor implementation does not have sufficient thermal response to generate useful data. And we're thinking of different designs we could use to collect more accurate data. Some possible ideas are moving the thermistor closer to the fin surface. And we've also considered replacing the thermistor with an alternate design. Um, again, that's something we're still working on and we don't have any solutions set in stone yet. Uh, next slide. So if you're interested in the project, you can contact me. My email is right here. Um, we need help with common filters and thermal design. And so if you're familiar with Bayesian filters, Python, digital signal processing, mechanical design and analysis and prototyping, or even if you're not familiar, but you're willing to learn, please just shoot me an email and um, I'll be in contact. Thank you.
And Ryan, do you want us to hold questions until all, everyone's presented? Or do yeah, we, we can. Uh, if you have any questions, um, you can type them in, of course. But I think we'll wait for, for questions at the end because uh, you know, that would probably be the best way to do that. Looks like Sean, maybe you're next. I believe so. All right. Hello, everyone. I'm Sean Perry. I'm one of the project leads for the Automated Acoustic Species Identification Team. All right. Next slide. Um, what we're be interested in is measuring biodiversity loss. Uh, in recent years, uh, we've had mass extinctions take out a lot of the animals on our planet. So that's already a good motivation to study biodiversity loss. But on top of that, understanding um, what species are suffering in an environment can help us better understand some of the uh, impacts to that environment, such as mega wildfires or climate change. So by understanding biodiversity loss across the planet, we can have a LIMAS test for some uh, for our planet's health. Next slide. There's a hand now. There's a handful of ways that uh, have people have done uh, biodiversity monitoring in the past. Some of the first few were animal tracking, feeding sites, and capture and release. These don't provide a, a great accurate measurement of biodiversity loss because you have to go out into an environment set or set up in a specific location that might not necessarily be representative of the whole sample. You, so you have to try to like find animals, you have to go out, do research, which takes time and money. In addition, some of these methods are incredibly invasive to the animals and the environment, such as caption release techniques. Next slide. So the next move after that is to start using technology to try to automatically uh, measure biodiversity monitoring. That one of those methods being camera trap arrays. Camera trap arrays are really great because since you can capture a lot of images of animals moving in an environment, you can give that to science projects and have since the scientists in the, uh, or across the world annotate the data. And thus you can get a massive resource for training machine learning projects, et cetera, et cetera. The problem with uh, cap with camera traps, even though it's a massive part of uh, monitoring biodiversity, is that it's limited to larger animals that are easily seen in photographs. You're not going to capture insects and birds with uh, with just a camera, which is a shame because that's insects and birds and other animals other than mammals make up a massive portion of the biodiversity of our planet. Next slide. What our team is interested in is passive acoustic monitoring. It's basically the process of putting out large audio arrays, you know, just audio recorders, microphones in an environment to try to pick up on various animal sounds. Then the goal would be to take the, the, that audio data, parse out the animal no sounds, and try to track and monitor animal species in that environment. This allows us to capture a larger array of animals because a lot of animals make noise, and that can help us get a better sense of biodiversity in a region. We can uh, use image processing techniques in this domain by converting audio data to image data via spectrograms. So we can take, so we can build off the developments of uh, image processing in the in recent years. The main issue we're facing currently is there is training data. It is really difficult to. Uh, get what we called strongly labeled data, which you, we know how many animal calls are in an audio clip. So since there isn't a lot of data and it can be a little difficult for uh, citizen scientists to be able to label the specific species of bird calls, it can be quite a challenge to actually uh, train some of the, these automated techniques. That is where we come in. Next slide. Our project started off um, after the Sandy, after our collaborators from the San Diego uh, Wildlife Alliance went out into the Peruvian Amazon to do an audio moss deployment. Audio moss are just systems on a chip that just record data in the environment. They're specifically designed for passive acoustic monitoring, and they're relatively cheap, so that's a good plus. <laughs> um, that deployment spanned a course about three months and collected 1,500 hours of audio data or about four terabytes of audio data. Uh, they needed methods to parse through that data, so they reached out to E4E, uh, and that's where our team uh, started off. So we've been working ever since to try to figure out ways to parse through this data, what automated techniques could work, what models to deploy, et cetera, et cetera. Next slide. 
So our uh, one thing we've done in the past is we've also done our own deployments after we got our team started. So uh, last summer, uh, me and a few other uh, members of our team went out to the Scripps Coastal Reserve, which is actually a reserve that is about five minute walk, a five minute walk away from near college here in UCSD. Uh, we went out, we deployed audio moss uh, around the reserve there to try to see if we could uh, capture uh, various endangered species that hide in the coastal uh, sage scrub of the reserve. We collected about uh, 300 hours of audio data or about one terabyte. Yeah. Next slide. Uh, for, so for this uh, quarter, we were focused on three things, mostly two things so far. Uh, the first of which is Pyronote. Pyronote is a audio annotation platform we've been trying to develop to uh, get laymen to help annotate our data. So that way we get the training data we need to actually help develop our models. Um, we're shifting this to a lower priority since we've managed to be uh, release this uh, in the summer. So most of the stuff is just uh, trying to enhance some of the stuff we want to do, such as we want to get user profile and user metrics to help uh, the users feel like they're gaining something from uh, the experience, be able to interact with the data they, they collect, et cetera, et cetera. We want to also try to make it easier for users to label data accurately and quickly. So we're spending a lot of time working on trying to create systems to increase labeling quality, but reduce the amount of time they spend working. And of course, we need to also communicate with local volunteers labeling da audio data from some of our local deployments. The other side of our work is with our Python package, PIHA. Uh, this is basically where we're trying to uh, parse through the audio data. Right now, we're working on converting what we call weakly labeled data, which is just, is there a bird in the clip, to strongly labeled data. At what time does the bird call appear in the clip? We're working to try to create methods to convert between those two. Uh, we're also trying to develop C CNNs and RNNs into our Python package. We tested a bunch of models last quarter, so we're working on trying to bring it in to our Python package. And of course, always trying to explore the state-of-the-art models to try to get a better sense of Q6 species identification. We're also looking towards trying, uh, trying to do some more audio MOS deployments in some more local reserves, trying to use this, the techniques we built up from our last deployment onto new projects. Uh, next slide. All right. So um, relevant skills, if you're interested in joining the team, again, we're looking for people who are willing to be dedicated, but mostly focusing on um, these various skills. So uh, Python, it helps to have some tensor, it helps to have some experience with some of these libraries. Um, uh, the screen kind of went down, it's cutting off the bottom part. I'll, I'll keep talking over it. Yeah, there you go, thank you. Sorry, Chris. <laughs> um, yeah, so it helps to have uh, some tensor, some Python experience since we are developing a Python package and a lot of the models we're working with is in Python. Um, we also, uh, it also helps to have some digital signal processing tech, technique experience because we, because it's, we're working with audio data. So understanding some of the uh, techniques used on audio data for, co for computation is quite handy. And of course, machine learning experience since we're trying to fit Autom to automatically identify species in our audio data. Um, on the web development side for Pyronote, it helps to know we use a lot of React and we use a lot of React on our front end side of things. And we're also looking at design aspects. So what elements of our design could be uh, enhance user's ability to label audio data, et cetera, et cetera. So if you have any UI experience, that is very handy to have. Uh, our backend runs in Python. So if you're experienced with using uh, Flask uh, to help as a backend system, that's useful. We also do, uh, we communicate, we store our data with SQL and we interface with that with SQL Alchemy, which is a library of Python. Again, you don't necessarily need to know the, these things. You just have to, it helps to have some experience with it. And of course, if you're interested in ecology, research, conservation, statistics, all those skills will come in handy with being part of the team. You don't have to have all the skills, but it helps. Yeah, next slide. 
Finally, if you want to learn more about our project, uh, I recommend taking a look at some of our GitHub pages. We have all our projects pub openly available open source. So you can take a look at those, interact with it, play with it a bit, get the idea if you, it's this is the kind of thing you're working with. You can also go to the uh, San Diego Zoo Wildlife Alliance if you're interested in learning more about their work in population sustainability. You can contact me at uh, the email address on the screen. And you can also con contact our other project lead, Jacob Ares. Jacob Ares primarily focuses on the Python package side of things. I kind of work with the PyroNote side. So if you're interested in that, uh, feel free to contact us. We'll answer any questions you have. Yeah. Uh, yeah. With that, I'll pass it off to uh, the Mangrove Monitoring Project. Okay, cool. Hey everyone, uh, I'm Dylan Hicks. I'm the current lead of the Mangrove Monitoring Project at Engineers for Exploration. Um, just to give a background of our project, uh, it's a collaboration between us and the Alberta Lab at the Scripps Institute of Oceanography to uh, conserve mangroves. So next slide. So I'll be asking, you know, what are mangroves? Um, one thing that I, my family wonders is, you know, you, you do research on mangroves? No, not exactly. Um, but mangroves are a type of tree species that live on the coast of tropical areas, uh, basically all over the world. Um, so they live in brackish water, which means uh, the intertidal, oftentimes the intertidal zone between uh, freshwater, so rivers, and also um, saltwater, the ocean. Um, so a lot of times the ocean comes up and that allows these ecosystems to really thrive. Um, next slide. So you might be asking why these specific type of trees? Um, so one thing that mangroves excel at is specifically carbon sequestration. Um, so mangroves are really good at taking carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere and turning it into biomass or the peat that they generate when they drop their leaves. So they can store almost twice as much carbon dioxide compared to you know, the most dense tropical rainforest that you'll see in the Amazon. Um, so they're really effective at you know, fighting climate change. Uh, one thing that mangroves are also good at is protecting it against the effects of climate change. So as climate change gets worse and worse with, uh, then you know, we see that tropical storms also get worse and worse. So mangroves can actually help against this, almost acting as a sponge against storm surges and other type of storms that you know, can affect a lot of the areas that mangroves are in. Um, also, mangroves act as the basically the fisheries for a lot of, uh, or the, the breadbasket for a lot of fisheries, offering them food uh, with, with, with their very nutrient-dense uh, nutrient dense peat. Um, so it really drives the economies of a lot of these areas, um, but they don't really realize the, the value of these, which is actually at $57,000 per hectare. So these mangroves are worth a lot. Uh, next slide. Yeah, so what we do to help this is threefold. So first, data acquisition. Um, we use drones to take high resolution images of these, of these mangrove ecosystems, uh, essentially allowing us to make high resolution data sets for machine learning workflow. So you could see one example of an image uh, to the top right. Um, that's actually one image that we went down to Baja, uh, California, Sur to record this, this imagery of, of this mangrove ecosystem. Um, we also recently took a trip, uh, actually just got back from Jamaica. So we have a, a plethora of data to use um, from field expeditions that our team actually goes out to record these images. Um, also, we do machine learning on these images. These images aren't just for nothing. Um, we develop machine learning models to you know, classify these mangrove ecosystems to measure their extent um, way easier than a, a manual labeling process. Um, so if you heard a bit before from, from Sean's presentation, labeling takes a while and even more so with, with, with really large images. So being able to do this in an automated fashion can save lots of time for ecologists and people working on the management of these coves. And lastly, we develop tools um, to essentially make it easier for scientists who are ultimately doing the work to save these mangroves um, to conserve them. Um, so pretty much tools for labeling, tools for machine learning, anything that we can help them out with. Uh, next slide. Um, so yeah, one thing that our team has recently been working on is, you know, of course, generating not just algorithms that use our drone imagery, 
but also satellite imagery. Um, so we're currently generating machine learning workflows to um, essentially classify satellite imagery, classify or, and, and generate biomass maps from satellite imagery and not just drone imagery. Um, so these workflows typically required you know, standard, standard machine, machine learning skills. So of course, deep learning libraries, if you know them, so TensorFlow, PyTorch, um, and any data science libraries that you know, um, scikit-learn, pandas, and numpy, and then of course, tying all those together is, is Python programming. Um, so those are the, the primary skills that we look for, uh, for students applying to, to, to work on this. Um, of course, you don't really need these skills. Well, we're willing to teach them and you know, motivation is a huge factor, but it's nice to have. Uh, next slide. And also we're looking for people willing to work on our image classification tool. Um, so one thing that you know, I think us engineers realize is a lot of the tools that we use and a lot of the scripts that we use aren't exactly easy for regular science scientists to use. So um, for a lot of us running a Python script is almost trivial, right? But for a actual you know, ecologist, that can take a lot of time and is really hard for them to run, especially if they don't have the hardware to run our machine learning algorithms. So we're developing a tool um, to actually do these ecosystem classifications um, on any computer. Um, they could just log into the website, upload their imagery, and it'll classify them for classify it for them. Um, so essentially, the skills needed for this, of course, is web development. So uh, we use Flask and Dash as a uh, back end and essentially a front end to visualize uh, these maps. And also, if you are familiar with cloud computing, um, so Azure or Heroku, um, or if you've worked with local service before, um, those are also wonderful skills to have um, when develop when helping develop uh, our image classification tool. Uh, next slide. So yeah, um, just as as a summary, um, we're looking for. Uh, people for two of our projects for, of course, uh, some, some of our future machine learning developments and also our image classification tool. Um, so, so mainly uh, Python for all of it. And yeah, don't, don't worry too much if you don't have the skills. I'm, I'm willing to learn. I really care about you know, your, your motivation and your uh, re really drive to, to learn these things. So feel free to shoot me an email or if you're on the E4E Slack already, just feel free to, to message me on there and I'll, I'll message, uh, I'll, I'll get back to you when I can. Thank you. Uh, hi, I'm uh, Mia Lucio, and I'm the current lead for the radio telemetry tracking project. Uh, next slide. Um, to start off, the um, to give some background for the project, the motivation for this. Um, so radio telemetry is a common tool used for tracking animals, um, usually for conservation monitoring efforts. Um, however, traditional methods of tracking animals often involve using a directional antenna to um, see what direction a transmitter is detected in, and then using that information in triangulation to see where the animal is, and then um, confirming that result on foot. And so obviously this can get very difficult on um, uneven terrain, on um, areas with large physical barriers. So um, it is very taxing in terms of time and effort. Uh, next slide. So um, as a um, solution to this problem, this project was created with the goal of creating a drone-based system for um, tracking animals. Um, so. This project was also created as a collaboration with the San Diego Zoo Wildlife Alliance. Um, and now in addition to working on a drone-based system, we are also um, working on implementing a tower system for tracking lizards, which I will um, talk a bit more about later. Uh, next slide. So um, one of our um, applications at the moment is um, collaborating with the LA Zoo and a um, and a drone making company called Airspace Consulting um, to track pandas in Chengdu, China. Um, so, our currently we have been working with them on uh, meeting their needs in terms of um, certain UI changes that they needed, and then um, we're also working on testing. Um, our system on their drone. 
um, to hopefully eventually be able to deploy it. And then, um, yeah, and we are also working on, we. And over the next quarter, we also hope on improving our signal detection accuracy and range for that. And um, yeah, uh, next slide. As for the lizard tracking system, the um, this is a collaboration with um, a professor at the University of um, Central Arkansas. Um, this project, um, as opposed to the other ones, is not drone based because um, the the requirements for this one was that we produce um, localization results every ten minutes with. Um, less than one meter accuracy. And because of um, this frequent time interval, um, it would be impossible for a drone to be able to apply that due to battery constraints um, and due to usually, um, drone maintenance that has to happen. Um, and so because of this, our plan is to um, use multiple towers to be able to um, detect where the, um, animals are within a given space. So um, currently we are working on changing our UI to be able to handle multiple systems. At the moment, it's only built to handle one because it's just the drone and the ground control station that are in that, um, that are considered in that system. And then we also need to improve um, our signal processing and ping detection autocorrelation script because um, at the moment it's, not um, it's not accurate enough to produce um, results with real data. Um, and then over the next quarter and at the beginning of summer, we also plan on actually assembling the physical towers. Um, currently, we are working on creating a sleep timer for the towers um, because as these will these will be out for several days. Um, so because of that, conserving energy is very important. So um, we want the system to be able to go to sleep and wake up reliably over the course of several days. And then um, we also need to design and produce multiple low noise amplifiers because the ones that we have currently, um, I believe are no longer available for purchase. So um, we are planning on creating our own. So that is for that project. Um, next slide. And then there is also um, opportunity for deployment in the summer, tracking boas in the Turks and Caicos Islands. Um, this will be using the drone system. And um, for this, we need drone pilots for um, local system testing, as well as to um, send and uh, run the drone in deployment. Um, so next slide. So um, these are current needed skills and open positions that we hope to fill. Um, we're looking for multiple drone pilots um, for this. We um, don't require any previous experience, um, but we do require a minimum three hour a week time commitment, and this will have to be in person. Um, we also are looking for a mechanical engineer to um, design those mounts to build the towers to um, mount all of our hardware. Um, we are also looking for a PCB designer to work on that um, those low noise amplifiers, and we are looking for um, someone for a software DSP position to work on our um, ping detection issues. Um, so, yeah. And um, yeah, so if anyone is interested, please contact uh, myself or Melina. Another, she is another person who works on organizing the project. Um, and thank you. Cool. Hi, everyone. My name is Parth, and I think Bill's on this call as well. And we're the co-leads for the Animal Behavior Monitoring Team. We're excited to show you guys a little bit more about our project. Uh, next slide, please, Chris. Cool. So in this project, we have it kind of split up into two sub-projects in a way. The first one is the burrowing owl detection, as well as the second one, which is the eye sleep monitoring. 
So in the past, we mainly focused on the Burrowing Owls project, which basically uses camera trap uh, images obtained by the San Diego Zoo. And our job is to identify which images have burrowing owls in them, as well as their position relative in the photo. Because for this, there's a lot of other species in the habitat as well. So being able to classify which photos have the owls versus which not helps the researchers parse through the um, large amount of data or photos in the sense. The top priority currently right now for our team is the AI sleep monitoring system. So the AI is endangered species and the researchers want to try to learn more about their habitat as well as characteristics, one of them being how they sleep and, for example, what time they sleep. And we're implementing a classification system at the moment to identify the different sleeping states of the AI as well. Next slide, please, Chris. Hi. Uh, yeah, like part that um, for the boring owl, the task is detection. Basically, means a classification plus the position um, detection. So we for this project, we have five stage, like four five stage in the pipeline. The first stage is to gather the data, basically to deploy a cam trap in the field and um, collect all the data. Uh, the next stage is to detect to detect which parts of the image might have the animals. Um, it doesn't matter which type of the animal is. Uh, the point is to pick up the interest object, object range. And the next step is to crop um, to crop these interest regions and then is to classify whether that animal is ours or not. And the final stage is to analyze uh, for the later analysis, like the positions, like there are yeah, many possible um, behavior uh, characteristics. Next slide, please. And as for the I project, the task is for is to monitoring the states. Uh, the current the current process is basically to um, first step is to identify if the I is in the nest or not, and we try to simulate this environment in our lab instead of in the field because of the current COVID situation. Um, and the pipeline looks like a little bit simpler. So the first so because we don't have the detection stage. Uh, gather the data, and then we have the um, CNN model to classify whether there is II in nest or not, and then uh, for the later analysis. And currently, the model we have is pretty okay. As you can see from the lower, lower left matrix, uh, we have a decent model, but um, the possible problem could be that uh, the environment in the field could be very different from the, the simulation in the lab. Yeah, that's basically one of our next step. So, which leads to the next slides. <clears throat> yeah, so goals of the year, the first thing is to complete the pipeline for the II. Um, basically, it means to accomplish the real-time inference pipeline. Gather the, gather the video data and run the frames through the model and output the desired metrics of the II to the... Um, to the to a specific place in a server, um, because at the end of the day, the ideal the ideal outcome could be to get the real time analysis, a real time straightforward demonstration of the AI sleeping um, states. So yeah, that's basically our first goal of this year, um, basically this quarter. And for the next, that is a little bit long term. It's prototyping a new end to end model uh, for the Boring Owl team. As I mentioned before, currently there are two separate stages one to detect and then to classify. And we aim to integrate this basically two stage to one to allow more uh, customization and potentially stronger performance. Um, yeah, next slide. So obviously, as most of you can tell, a lot of our project is machine learning and computer vision oriented. So a couple of the skills that we're looking for are would be a machine learning background as well as Python, because that's the scripting language that we're using for a lot of our pipeline and data organization. As well as specific to the II team, we're also doing a lot of hardware integration by having sensors, different types of sensors, such as camera or audio detection. So if, if anyone has experience with working with sensors, but like uh, Professor Ryan mentioned in the beginning and all the other uh, 
co-lead so far. As long as there's that dedication and passion to pick up those skills, we'll, we would be more than willing to help you guys learn and teach you those skills. And yeah, uh, if you have any questions, uh, mine and Bill's emails, they're in that bottom right corner there. And thank you guys so much. Hello, everyone. This is Giovanni from the Myark Archaeology Project. I studied computer science at UCSD uh, with emphasis on XR development. And uh, for this project, our collaborators are from uh, UT Austin, Mayan archaeologist Edwin Roman and Tom Garrison. And so for this project, we focus on exploring digital documentation, visualization, and distribution of archaeological data for cultural heritage, preservation, and public outreach. We send students out to Guatemala every summer uh, as part of the RU to collect more data uh, for various digital reconstructions of their ancient ruins over there. And we do this because the most common techniques archaeologists have uh, have used in the past to collect and share information uh, has been like drawing illustrations, taking photographs, and uh, hand mapping tunnel networks. And so our goal is to develop applications and techniques that use the latest technology and game engines and remote sensing to provide the archaeological community with tools to digitally archive and share immersive reconstructions. And so uh, this uh, Video right here is a the result of that in uh, the Unreal game engine. Um, so next slide. And an overview of the kind of uh, workflow um, is we go out to these places equipped with different types of uh, equipment, such as a, a LiDAR scanner, cameras, maybe even on uh, aerial cameras. and the goal is to capture as much like um, data points or photographs to then combine them later on in post-processing. Um, and so uh, next slide. And so yeah, that post-processing step, um, ideally we'd like to automate as much of this as possible. Um, and this is um, falls under somewhat of a, a game artist um, for those of you familiar with like game development, maybe uh, creating art for that, um, 3D art is, uh, this is where that falls under this category. And um, yeah, there's a, there's a window, <laughs> Chris. But uh, next slide. So after that post-processing step, which we'll talk about a little bit later, and um, the result of that is you get this, uh, you process the data in this format that you can then um, visualize or send to different applications. So one of the things we've done is we've uh, created like a, a application Unreal Engine uh, specifically to like view models and take high resolution photos for maybe for like uh, papers. And uh, next slide. Mm. There might be a video that plays, but oh. we also. The tomb belonged to an elite yeah. individual. There were four pots, uh, including one that had a dancing spider monkey, uh, another that represented a model of. So we created this uh, Unity application for the Oculus headsets, uh, Oculus Quest, to, done to this pyramid uh, allow you to kind of traverse these locations uh virtually so and also I'm have narration to understand like the context of what you're seeing and so this is where you know the out resolve everything where we combine all our data um whether it's audio uh, lidar scans or photographs the large vaulted next slide probably once held the and so building upon that um we'd like to develop some sort of uh, more techniques and uh, workflows to kind of facilitate, you know, we, we've built um, 
models of like specific sites like M71 or did you see labels here like or the Diablo these are um, archaeological excavation locations and so we've kind of mapped out those uh, around those regions but what if we could kind of go to these locations and uh, with a map and kind of combine all our scans onto this map and you know being able to quickly explore them whether you are on um, a desktop of your headset, make it just having generalizing that um, um, experience interactivity across all these different platforms. Next slide. And so this was um, kind of a quick prototype of using um, the latest plugins in like Unreal Engine, Cesium, it's a geospatial uh, company. Uh, to bring the globe into these game engines as a platform to kind of mess around with. Uh, next slide. And so we kind of gone over um, uh, the process of like digital documenting and like visualizing them. And what about like distribution? Um, we can, you know, view this content VR headsets. We might have these in some sort of cave, say, cave systems on different campuses or museums. Um, also providing kind of a way for people across or archaeologists like you know that live in other countries or states to how do they quickly view the data that we have without them needing to you know download a massive like file of like a terabyte of data and then having to somehow run that you can we can create like uh, websites for them to go and kind of uh, take measurements um, of their scans. Next slide. And so if you want to get started or if you're curious of like what, what goes into this, if you've never done game dev or art like this, we do have a public uh, GitLab that you can find. Um, and I've uh, begun like filling out this kind of wiki of the, the techniques we've used to successfully create these, these models and visualizations. And actually what's uh, great to just announce is like, all the tools I use like uh, would be like ZBrush, maybe Blender, like 3ds Max, um, Substance Painter by Adobe. Uh, these are all kind of professional tools, but actually as students, um, you can pick this up and, you know, teach yourself this without needing to worry about like purchasing anything because all the tools um, we've used to do this are free to set up and learn how to use. And next slide. And I mean, yeah, just real quick, it's like um, first you need to process the, the LiDAR scans and generate a mesh, which you need to optimize. Next slide. Um, so let's go, this is part of the, that workflow you can check out. Um, the LiDAR scan picks up like wires um, and other debris that you want to remove if you want to create like a really accurate model. Next slide. Um, just going down the you know, the pipeline, eventually you get to the game engine after you optimized and next slide. And then, you know, needing to program that model into like some sort of application to traverse. So we have a, a VR application if you have Oculus headsets uh, available, if, if you'd like to try this out. Next slide. And so this has kind of been a game dev heavy project. And so a lot of the stuff uh, listed here is associated with that, which kind of breaks down, um, which I think into kind of the programming side and then the, the whole art generation pipeline. Um, so if you have uh, experience with any of those, or if you'd like to pick up on any of those, um, you can reach out to me. And yeah, take care everyone, next slide. So I'm going to go through basically super quick through through this um, and basically just talk a little bit about kind of my project. My name is Christopher Crutchfield, and I am the uh, Baboons on the Move team lead. So we study baboons in, Ken in Kenya using computer vision from drones. So this is kind of one of one of the videos that, that we've collected, use this one mostly just to kind of show what things look like and to give you a sense of scale. 
we mostly actually end up processing videos that look more like this. And as you can see, it's super hard to kind of gauge where the animals are because of how high we are. Uh, and as you might expect, traditional uh, use of like machine learning and whatnot are not super effective here. So we've kind of adapted other technologies, which unfortunately, uh, just to, uh, for the sake of time, I will be kind of jumping through quite quickly, but um, can kind of see that that these other techniques lead to uh, basically, sorry, I'm going to, oh, sorry about that. Um, but these other these other techniques kind of lead to uh, uh, basically segmentation of things that are moving. So, so we we do this mo mostly by so we do this mostly by by following these steps which to be super brief through it is to find common features, match those features, compute basically the transformation that camera, so that the camera has gone to. So between here, we're looking at uh, multiple frames in, in, in the into the past and then trying to like undo those transformations. Uh, we, then, we then basically attempt to change the perspective of the camera and to match them up. We do some combination of, of intersections between the, the history frames and unions of the history frames to generate what we call the effective for or effective background, and then we use that uh, we, we use that basically to compare against the current frame to try to figure out what the uh, to try to figure out what the background would be. Um, we have a bunch of open projects. You can see them here on the screen, um, but basically they. Uh, kind of consist of wanting to make some modifications to our stuff to use CUDA to be able to replace some of our Python code C++ and put together a GUI. These are kind of all existing, um, these are kind of all existing projects that you are, that you'd be welcome to join. Uh, I'm going to bring your attention to the last bullet th though, as we're all, we're trying to run experiments against the existing Python code base to hopefully try to publish soon. Um, we do have a bunch of open questions uh, that are potential that that could be potential research topics. I had a student last quarter who took on another one of these questions that's no longer listed here. That took them the majority of the quarter to basically answer, and uh, they were able to get some nice data as a result. Um, so some common skill sets that we that we might need are Python, C plus. CUDA, JavaScript and TypeScript, CSS, HTML, and just general computer vision. Um, and you can contact me here. So I'm going to yield now to Fish Sense. Alrighty. Thanks, Chris. Um, so, hey, everybody. Um, I'm Patrick, the project lead for Fish Sense, and um, here today to talk to you about what we do. Um, next slide. So FishSense is, um, oh, is if this video will second. load. So there's a couple of videos it's telling me I don't have permission to view. Oh, really? Oh, shoot. OK. Do um, you want me to share instead? Yeah, yeah I that will, might be good. Yeah, I'll, here, go ahead. Just one second, let me open it up. All right. So, in while Viva, um, our current current uh, software lead is pulling up stuff, um, I'll talk to you about what we do. So, um, FishSense is in essence a three D underwater camera system uh, for uh, for viewing fish populations and being able to measure like length and biomass information. It's um, got a huge advantage over uh, other ways of measuring fish length. Um, Currently, because it's really, really small, um, it's. I think our current design is about uh, eight inches um, 
long and uh, six inches in diameter. Uh, it's really powerful. It utilizes an Intel RealSense D four fifty five as well as um, as well as an NVIDIA TX two to do the uh, computing on the system. All of these parts are off the shelf, which makes it super affordable, and it's very very modular. Um, so I'll talk to you guys a little bit more about um, the uh, the system uh, future goals uh, later in the presentation. Um, so the screen is, can you guys see the screen? Yeah. Okay. Uh, so for the software, we've done a couple of things. Uh, so one of the earliest things we did was we worked with Pacifico Aquaculture, which is an aquaculture company uh, down in Mexico. So Peter, the former Fish Sense lead, and Patrick both went down, collected some data from Pacifico Aquaculture, and we were able to bring this uh, data back. And we borrowed code from the Baboon Monitoring Project uh, to do some motion tracking on fish. And so with this, we were able to just uh, create some contour lines around the movement of the fish. And th through that, we were able to estimate about how many fish were actually uh, in, in the water. And that's a really big thing for aquaculture. So hopefully moving forward, we'll be able to do more of this. Uh, so this right now is our, our very primitive YOLO network that we're using. Uh, so we annotated a couple of hundred images ourselves, and we found thousands of more on the internet. And using that, we're able to create a, a YOLO network to basically uh, detect fish. So I don't know if you noticed the problem here. It's just that sometimes fish are detected as rocks, and rocks are detected as fish. Uh, so this is uh, something that we're trying to work on using basically the in using the Intel RealSense camera. Um, so if you, if you see this camera here on the left side, you will see the depth imaging. On the right side, you'll see the RGB. So our goal going forward is to not only use the depth to get the measurement and the biomass of the fish, but also use the depth somehow to uh, augment our detection algorithm. Uh, so this is what we will be working on going forward. Yep. Uh, next slide. And, and on the hardware end, um... You can see this is a little animation breakdown of the system. We have two of these already built minus the handles. And um, this upcoming quarter, we're going to be looking at building uh, five of these modules for a, a deployment in partnership with the Nature Conservancy. Um, you can see the real senses at the front. And what's about to be disassembled here are the most fun pieces, the uh, power and IO board. Uh, which is coming off right now. And then attached to it is uh, the NVIDIA TX2. And so uh, we are also going to be looking for people, uh, next slide, who are interested in, in working on refining our PIO board. Our first revision has a few issues with it um, that we discovered this past quarter. So we're going to be doing a, re a second revision um, and building and testing it uh, and implementing it in all of our systems. Um, in addition to that, uh, we're going to be looking for people to uh, work on the embedded uh, embedded system side, um, programming that TX2 in order to uh, optimize our, our video uh, capture, uh, detect when things are happening in front of the camera for, for longer deployments, and be able to help optimize our, our data saving because uh, we're, we're gathering raw Ross bag footage off of the camera, and I think like an hour of footage comes out to something like a terabyte or two of data. So definitely a lot of limited uh, storage capabilities. Um, so this technology has a lot of really great applications in conservation, research, and aquaculture. Um, as Viva mentioned earlier, uh, we are able to take this camera out to like fish farms and be able to give them pretty accurate counts of how many fish uh, are in are in their tanks, uh, what kind of health they're in based on like their their size and things like that. Um, and of course, uh, on the conservation and research side, we're looking to get these cameras in the hands of citizen divers so that they can take them in their own dives, uh, look for. Uh, various species of fish underwater so that we can identify them, monitor uh, monitor the populations and health, um, be able to implement uh, new legislature to like protect certain species and things like that. Um, this is one of our 
recent deployments from, uh, or not so recent actually, from Birch Aquarium. Um, you can see that's with our version one prototype. It's much longer. Um, this quarter, if you do decide to join, we should be going back to the Birch Aquarium to uh, see what the divers think of our second versions. And you'll be contributing towards um, putting those things together and, and making the software work. So yeah, as I mentioned, um, we're looking for electrical engineers and embedded systems engineers to uh, refine our hardware and our firmware. Uh, we're looking for mechanical engineers to d continue developing uh, our prototypes and look at expanding the capability into something like a camera trap um, where it would be placed out uh, like in a riverbed or something for a week with some bait uh, so it can capture a lot of data's worth of fish. Um, and then finally, we're looking for uh, ML and computer vision engineers uh, to continue refining our machine learning models and uh, try and implement some pre-processing and post-processing uh, algorithms on the data. Thanks, thanks everybody for uh, listening. Anybody have any questions? Alrighty, cool. Thank you very much. Thanks all. So. Um... If you're interested in any of those projects, um, we have an intake form just to try to organize this a bit more better. Um, so feel free to uh, go to the E3 site. Uh, fill that out soon. I would just do it right now while you're thinking about it. And um, people will reach out to you uh, to talk to you about uh, the fit on their project. Um, so we're trying to do this quickly. Uh, so we want to uh, get the application basically as soon as possible. And then we'll come back and chat with you most likely and make a decision shortly after that. Um, so I need to run to another meeting, but uh, if you have any other questions, uh, definitely feel free to stick around or uh, email or get in contact with all the project leads. They are the people that um, know the most about these projects and the ones that you'd be working with most closely. Uh, so you talk with Kurt and I and Nathan and others um, to get support for this. But uh, yeah, the, the, the project leads and, and those people that you saw today talking about the projects are, are, are really the ones that know what's going on and uh, will have the best information about how you could fit into the project. Uh, we'll post all this recording uh, at some point soon on the website as well if you have any more questions. But uh, really, I just encourage you to fill that intake form out and uh, yeah, please uh, don't hesitate to, to uh, reach out and contact us. Um, thank you all attending and uh yeah i hope uh, some of the leads can stick around and uh hope to see you in some of the, the future project lead meetings and see you around in the uh, event so here is a list of kind of all of the um all of the team leads um, actually, looks like this might be a little bit out outdated uh, as the fish sense lead has has changed. Um, so I apologize about that. I will make sure that this is updated before it gets posted. Um, and here, if you need to reach out to any, if you need to reach out to any of the staff the either the staff engineer or the pis they are available here um where can we find the posted slides uh i believe they will be posted on the website along with the video i think that's what we did last quarter so so overall i uh, thank you everyone for your attention uh feel free to, to fill out our intake form and you can expect an email back from us uh, likely by April 13th. So I think the, lead, the leads, including myself, are gonna stick around for a little bit to answer any questions. Um, I, uh, if there, so in the chat, there's a question asking if there 
Are there any particulars that are pro projects that you guys are interested? Can you contact them? Yes. If if uh, a project that that if you're interested in a project listed on our website, uh, feel free to contact the uh, person listed on the contact page for that project. There are any further questions? I have a quick question. Go ahead, yes. Hi, I'm Ashley. I'm a second year PhD student in BioSci. And I just came across your group's website like last night. Um, so I'm like really happy I got to attend today's session because I thought I would miss it. Um, but I'm like really interested in learning about like how other biologists can get involved in this like group. Um, Cause I know you like in the presentation, it was like ecologists, like conservation people, you know, marine people. Um, have you guys like advertised this to other departments as well? Kurt, I am going to uh, yield that question to you. Um, okay, so uh, I, so my, my understand, understanding and, uh, and uh, take it with a, oh, hold on. Okay, can, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, yeah, so I just had to step out, I was in an exam. Um, yeah, so normally it's been, mostly word of mouth. Um, so this is, we haven't really done like an, an outreach to, uh, let's say, just like scientists in general, it's typically like, well, if, if you know a colleague who may be interested uh, in these type of technologies that we've built, um, just let them know and they can reach out to myself and to Ryan Kastner, and then we can basically, we can talk. So that, that's typically what has happened to you. We've built these, uh, these projects over the last, well, 10 years. And so often people are like, oh, if you can do this, then you can probably do this other thing that really seems like really similar and that would really help me. And so, so if you see a technology where you're like, oh, this seems to be very close to what we need in, 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 a, in my field of research, then uh, feel free to just reach out to us and we can meet and we can see like if, if what you need is indeed something we can build or we can help you with. Cool. Sounds great. Thanks so much. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Kurt. Any, are there any further questions? Cool. So if anyone comes up with any questions that they'd like to ask in the future, feel free to reach out to us. Um, our emails, you can either reach out to, to, the, to Nathan, the staff engineer, or either the PIs, Ryan Kastner and Kurt Sugars, or you can reach out to the leads. Again, noting that, uh, that I need to update the slide to uh, represent the correct fish sense lead. But otherwise, thank you all for your time and uh, have a good rest of your day. All right, see, uh, see everyone around.